So my family is coming from a little tiny place where we produce the best Swiss cheese, Letiva, sort of Gruyere. But for sure, the future of Switzerland cannot rely only on cheese and chocolate. So we invest a lot into innovation. The good thing is that innovation is really a key value right now. Just look at all the website of companies. Innovation. Even more, disruptive innovation. That's really the buzz. But really think about the definition. At least the definition of innovation, and there's a lot of them, they often goes towards one thing. It's an invention that is adopted by the user. It includes the impact. So when we speak about disruptive innovation, how can people adopt something which is not related to what they already know? They might have other things to do with their work, their social engagement, family, than to understand just the last cool thing. So how we can overcome what might be an utopia? I'll try to show you through three examples that we did in our lab the role of design in this. The first example is augmented reality. Augmented reality is really a technique. It's a scientific performance. You can add virtual information around a physical object. OK, but how we can turn this in a real media, into the next media? It means that people must not look at the technology. They must look at the story that we tell, at the sh value that we want to share. But most of the people are researching about the technical performance on it, and very few about how we tell stories. I'll show you one of the um, installations that we did several years ago. It was uh, done by Vincent Jacquier from Ecal. And we had to make a kind of a demo. It was also a test for us, a research, in Milano. And we wanted to augment something that everybody has in its own pocket in Milano. And what do you have in your pocket in Milano? Banknotes. So let's look at this installation. We just ask the people to put the banknote on the top of the machine, and the banknote will reveal its second nature, so that money is linked to desire. So you see, there's, <laughs> there's no gender issue. It's randomly a male or a girl. <laughs> so beyond the funny stuff that you see here, we could study a lot of things. For instance, how we make a credible relation between the object and the augmentation. And you see it in the first half second. You see the little dots, they begin to move. And this acknowledge that something can move in your physical object. So people don't look at the camera here. They don't look at where is the technology. They really put their banknote, and then when they go back with everything in their pocket, they feel a bit strange, not knowing what they have in their, in their pocket. The second installation uh, that uh, I will show you is here, it's a tattoo. So here we augment a tattoo. For sure, we don't tattoo the people at the entrance of the exhibition. Uh, we just put a fake tattoo, and the tattoo change with the time. Here, we study how we can relate visual, uh, virtual augmentation to your limb, to some really physical part of your body. Also, how we can modify something which is permanent. Tattoo is an icon of permanence. And you can think that there's a lot of uh, application, for instance, in the jewelry industry. So with augmented reality, if we turn this into a real experience for the user, there's a fantastic application, there's a huge potential, because when you buy an object, it's not only for its aesthetic, for its function, it's also because it tells you a story, it has some environmental uh, values, social values. So that was really an example where we start from one technology that we turn into a user experience through design. The second example is what we can do with all the digital archives. Again, it's a product of the technology. We turn, we have a lot of archives, and this is an example with the Montreux Jazz Festival. APFL was able to make a deal with the Montreux Jazz Festival to see how we can digitalize all the archives. It's the biggest archive in the world, 5,000 hours of audiovisual uh, recording since 1967, uh, the biggest in the world on jazz and uh, blues rock concert. So there's a lot of lab working, how you can recreate the metadata, how you can improve the quality, restore the quality, but then what do you do with this? In fact, you have right now YouTube YMAO interfaces. Great, but not very immersive. You have your home cinema, also great, but it's you in the dark facing a flat wall, and it's not very interactive. So then we begin to thought about a special, specific experience for this content. A lot of people told us, yes, you should be as close as possible from the origin concert. Okay, but the 
original experience is when you go to Montreux, you drink some beer facing the Alps and the lakes. You go in the concert among 3,000 people. This is something that you cannot recreate with these archives. So we created something totally different. You see that people can browse together the interface. Two people can browse together. They can exchange their knowledge about musicians. They can exchange their souvenirs. They are not totally in the black. They still exist physically. They lean over an uh, interactive table uh, to interact. Then they lean back to be in an immersive position. And they can always see each other. In fact, the best feedback that we had on this installation is, was by Claude Knobs, the founder of the Montreux Jazz Festival. He came at our lab to see the, the results, and after five minutes, he turns towards me and told me, you know, I've never seen my concert like this. So we're able to achieve something that doesn't exist, which is specific to this uh, digital archives. We also work here with the architectural lab of EPFL, Alice, to work on the shape of the screen so that you feel really in the middle of the, of the space without tricking your eyes with a kind of fake 3D thing. And the, the shape of the screen is inspired by the trompe l'oeil in the Baroque church in, uh, in Italy. So the last example, you saw that we have really a physical dimension of um, the interface. Here, we wanted to work on a physical object. And so we took one case, uh, and it's the TV remote control. This looks weird, but in fact, it's very interesting. Why? It has never been a real object. People like the nice vase that they have in their house. They buy, uh, they buy a nice lamp. They're proud of their ugly mug that they took back from the last trip to Venice. But they're proud of it, they, they show it to you. But it's quite rare that they see, oh, I have a nice remote control, see, it's put it in my living room. <laughs> but why? It's also an object sitting in the middle of the living room. So we work with four design school. We really rethink the relation to the object, about the material, about the way that we move this material. And we were able to discover, to reconnect with the physical aspect of the object. Right now, we are tapping with the tip of our fingers. We're sliding our fingers on the on the, on the tablets, or even with nothing in the air. No, it's nice to have something in our hands, and we can re rediscover with designer the meaningfulness of this object in our interaction with the uh, digital world. So I will finish my talk. First, I hope that I was able to convince you that design can be a real instrument to overcome this disruptive uh, innovation idea by really reconnecting the uh, proposition with the, um, with the users. In fact, if we have schools like EPFL, it's to produce disruptive uh, uh, technology. If we have this disruptive technology, it's not to replace just old ones by new ones, it's also to think about disruptive scenarios. But then we have this work to reconnect this proposition to the daily life of the user. And so where design is important, to think about the scenarios and then to put it in the social and cultural context of the user. In my lab, I mean, we're not the only lab working on this relation between design and technology, and you know some of them for sure, but we have a specific way to tackle this issue. The first one is that it's really about creating knowledge. It's not a trick of magic. You know, magic is great the first one, uh, the first time that you see it, fantastic. The second time, you just try to look how it was done, and the third time, there's no interest. If you want to do innovation and want to have impact, it must be on a long-term impact so that people really use it, adopt it. The second thing is we want to combine the difference between the disciplines, not to abolish this difference. An engineer needs four years, a designer needs 12 months, will not make a project in two and a half years. We try to combine the dynamic of each of them. The third thing is going from ideas to impact. In the Montreux Jazz, we need to build the real stuff. We couldn't guess if the people who are saying, wow, it's great, and after five minutes, they try to look where is the vomiting bag because it's too shaky and uh, the, the dizziness. No, it's important that we could see if they feel well. The last thing is want to have the idea of supernormal, that the people feel well. The essence of normality that was created by Nato Fukuzawa some years ago in 2007 when we created the lab. And Read the last one, <laughs> is that we must not forget to address the world of cessation, what is really our gut feeling. Don't trust only the storytelling, we must reconnect the storytelling with our inner soul, our really the feeling of the world of sensation that we have.
Thank you very much. Thank you.